Good evening, Lisa. We're so glad to have you. You are welcome tonight for this powerful love talk. We welcome you. God bless you. We are now on Facebook Live recording. Good evening, Dr. White Washington. It is such an honor to be here, and I am truly honored and humbled that you invited me to be the guest speaker for this evening, Sister for Sisters Love Talk. You are not alone. Um, I do not take it lightly when it comes to the subject of domestic violence, um, as I am a survivor and I lost my only sister 31 years ago to the strongholds of domestic violence. And before we get started this evening, I would like to share with each of you the tags of domestic violence, and those will be verbal, emotional, sexual, financial, physical, spiritual, bullying, cyberbullying, and elder abuse. Some of the main root causes of um, an abuser wanting and needing control are the following. Learned behavior, which is something that we talk often about. Um, learned behavior, which will come from your environment, your households. Um, Oftentimes, we like to deceive ourselves to think that if we are, in fact, victims in a household, our children are not victims, and that is just not the truth. If you are in a domestic violence situation or relationship, your children, too, are victims of domestic violence. And um, one or two things can come out of that. You teaching your children to become abusers, or you are in fact teaching your children that abuse is okay. And oftentimes they become victims and or abusers of domestic of domestic violence. Um, also cultural beliefs, um, a, a cultural belief that one has total control over another. Um, anger issues, anger management issues, jealousy, low self-esteem, feeling inferior, personality disorders or psychological disorders, um, as well as alcohol and drugs are all contributing factors to um, one being an abuser. Statistics show us that 76 women are shot and killed by an intimate partner, 76 women per month. 10% of men are murdered by an intimate partner. Access to a gun makes it five times more likely that a woman will be murdered at the hands of her domestic abuser. Nearly 1 million women alive today have had a gun used against them by an intimate partner. Some of the red flags that we often ignore, all of us, each of us, none of us are exempt, are manipulation. And that could be from our abusers telling us what to wear, what not to wear, holding us in isolation, um, checking our phones, Verbal abuse, meaning they joke with you and they toy with you and um, and then they have a way of using it emotionally against you to say, oh, you're just in your feelings or oh, I was just playing. So that verbal abuse and that joking, it leads over into emotional abuse. Um, also, one of the things that our abusers are known for is making us feel guilty for their behavior which goes back again to emotional abuse. So it is important that we pay attention to red flags from the very beginning. It just doesn't happen once we dive deeper into relationships or friendships. Um, it, it starts off suddenly, it, it may start off subtle, but we must be very cautious and we must pay very close attention to the red flags 
of domestic violence. Some of the key principles that I like to teach and share with others is that we must, when it comes to our healing, is face our truth, give ourselves grace, make sure that we're telling ourselves that it is not our fault, and also owning the up to that we are responsible for our own healing, whatever that looks like for you. It, you know, your healing journey is going to look differently for you than it may look for someone else. And also keeping in mind that um, oftentimes when you're speaking of therapy, you may need a specialized therapist who specializes specifically in domestic violence and not just a a regular counseling or, or therapy. Um, oftentimes we suffer from PTSD as um, it relates to domestic violence. So when I sought out help and when I was going through help, um, I was just blessed enough to be able to um, seek help from someone um, who I love very dearly, who is not only a behavioral specialist, but she specialized in domestic violence. And these principles will have you on your way to taking your life back. And before we dive deeper into my story, I would just like to say that if there is anyone that you know, or if you yourself are a victim of domestic violence, you can reach out to the domestic violence hotline at 1-800-799-799. 33. As I shared early on, my only sister was murdered by her husband 31 years ago due to the strongholds of domestic violence. Um, they were high school sweethearts. And at some point they um, went their different, you know, different ways and different paths. And years later, um, they reconnected. Their relationship started off abruptly. I mean, it was quickly. And that is one of the flags that we all must pay attention to as well when things just happen so abruptly. Um, they got married and um, my sister was already the mother of a young child at the time, a single mom. And um, Right after getting married, um, she became pregnant by her then husband and they had a baby girl. After my sister became pregnant and she birthed their second child, he did not want her to work anymore. So he, you know, started to take over the control. First, it was the, 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 the you know, the, the abrupt relationship, then the marriage, and then the baby comes. And now um, he's telling her that she does not need to work because he could take care of her and the family. Um, they fell into financial hard times. He was in over his head. Um, he couldn't afford the lifestyle that she was accustomed to. And um, he was very threatened um, by our family and what my parents could do for my sister and our family. So that was a, a, a concern of his and um, it led to jealousy. It led to him feeling like he was less than it made him feel inferior. Um, some of the some of the, the behaviors that I just shared with each of you. And ultimately the the abuse began, which my family and I had no knowledge of. We did not know that he was abusive to my sister as well as my nieces. And um, my sister at one point, I guess she got tired and she wanted out of the marriage, which we did not know. Um, we soon discovered later on that my sister was being beat on on a daily basis. And um, my niece, who at the time was eight years old, um, was my sister's savior. She was the one who would help my sister. She was the one who would jump in between the fights when my sister and her husband were in physical altercations. She was the one who had called the police on numerous occasions for help when she witnessed her mother being um, beat. 
which we did not know. The ironic thing about my sister being in an abusive marriage was that I was in my own abusive marriage at the time. And we never shared that either of us were in abusive marriages. Um, and that goes back to what I discussed about uh, abusers learning their behavior, you know, from cultural um, acceptances or in the household. I grew up in a household where I was not abused, but my father was a drug addict, my biological father. And oftentimes my mom and my dad would have, you know, arguments and fights. And um, while my sister and I never physically saw the, the physical abuse taking place, we were still in the household. And that goes back to when you are in an abusive household. The children are not off limits. You can put a child in the closet. You can tell a child to go in the room and shut the door. But out, out, our brains are observing, you know, ab absorbing everything, you know, just like a sponge. So we're, absor we're absorbing it. We're seeing it. We're hearing it. And so while my parents always thought that they were protecting us, in essence, they really weren't because we could still hear the physical altercations taking place. We can still hear the arguments taking place. And I re remember vividly one night, um, and I cannot remember how, a how old I was. I think my mom had just had enough. We they were fighting about money, of course, because as I said, my father he he had a heroin addiction, and um, we were living in North Carolina at the time, and um, my mom was concerned about us being evicted, and she wanted to know from my dad where the money was for the rent, and of course, he spent the money, and I remember my mom and my dad being out on the balcony, and I could just hear, "I'll kill you." you know, I'm, I'm tired of this. And, um, my mom finally got up enough courage to leave and she never went back. We didn't go back because there was a time where we were traveling from Washington, DC to North Carolina, Washington, DC to North Carolina. My father's family lived in North Carolina and my mother's family is here from Washington, DC. Um, we never talked about it. We never discussed it. You know, we just got in the car one day, packed up, and we were headed back to Washington, D.C. Um, I did have a very close relationship with my father. Although he was a drug addict, he honestly, I can say he was the best father ever. Um, he took care of me. He, um, he did not neglect me. Um, he was a very loving father, and I love spending time with him. In my, you know, teenage years, I would go to North Carolina to spend time with him during the summers and during the holidays up until the time when my dad um, died suddenly um, from a heart attack. And that was when I was in my adult years, in my early, in my late 20s, I believe. And um, so we had a we had a beautiful relationship. We 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 honestly did. Um but there were some things that stuck out to me um, from my childhood that I did not like about him. And that was that um, he always cheated on my mom. Um, and I just remember the times where, you know, my mom may have put us in the room and shut the door. And, you know, I remember those arguments. I remember those fights taking place. And I never shared any of those things with my mother nor my father. And like I said, although he was a great father to me, I never forgot the treatment that my mother was given. And oftentimes we do not, you know, as children, we grow up into adults. Absolutely. My sister, April was saying emotional abuse. I, I, I never forgot those things. And, um, and somewhere in the back of my mind, I disliked him for those reasons. I loved him, but I disliked him for those reasons, even after he died. And I still carry a part of that with me today. Um, you know, when I go back and I think about things and we have what you call triggers, um, there was just so many things that I disliked about my dad when it came to the way he treated my mother. Um, 
So back to my sister and I, you know, we never discussed that we were in domestic violence relationships because, you know, oftentimes, sadly, as you grow up into teenage years or into your adult years, you actually think that this behavior is normal. And so I thought it was normal. I thought it was love if someone put their hand on me. I thought it was love if we were in an argument. I thought it was love when I was being isolated. But what I was being was actually manipulated, um, emotional abuse. On July 19, 18, 1993, my brother-in-law brutally murdered my sister. It was a heinous crime. Um, it was a heinous murder and um, something that my family and I are still trying to process 31 years later and still trying to get through. Um, my sister called me on my job a week prior to July 18th and, and asked me if anything should ever happen to her, would I volunteer to take care of her children? And I, at the time, had no idea what she was talking about. I told my sister that I would call her back and we can discuss whatever it is that she, you know, she wanted to discuss with me later. That Sunday, July 18th, 1993, my sister and I had a ritual every Sunday. We would watch the Sunday movies that came on at 9 p.m. at night. That was just a ritual that we had. Um, we would pick a movie in the TV guide and we would decide what we were going to watch and we would call one another at 9 p.m. so that we can watch the movies together um, over the phone. Um, my sister during that time called me that night at 9 p.m. She told me a few minutes later that she heard something at the door and that she would call me right back. And it is now October 24th, 2020, 24, and I am still waiting for my sister's call. I haven't received that return call yet. Whew. Within 15 minutes later, my sister was brutally murdered. Her husband returned home from work that night, unbeknownst to her. He lured her downstairs into their storage bin. And in that storage bin, he had a gun um, and a metal pipe and a knife. He stabbed my sister 30 plus times in the upper torso. He shot her in the head four times at close range. And he completely crushed her skull. And, um, when I share that, I don't go in any particular order, but there was an order to how he, what he did and how he did it. Um, he left her in her storage bin to die. He cleaned up the storage bin and he placed her body, a, a, a plastic trash garbage bag over her body. He locked my two nieces in the closet and they could hear their mother being brutally murdered by their father. After he murdered my sister, he went back upstairs to check on the girls and he raped my eight-year-old niece, who was her mother's savior and, you know, tried to do everything that she could do to save her mom from the whoopings and, and from the threats. And um, this particular night, he had a plan, premeditated murder. He planned the entire murder out. After he raped my eight-year-old niece, he threatened her and told her that if she ever spoke of it or told anyone that he would kill her. He called my parents at 2.46 a.m. on Ju Monday, July 19th in the morning. And he told my parents that when he returned home from work, my sister was not home. Her car was home, her children were home, but she was not home. My parents automatically knew that something was wrong. 
Um, my sister, one, she could not drive at night because um, she was declared legally blind at night and could not drive at night. Um, two, she would never, ever, which is one, leave her children home by themselves. He then called me and he asked me, would I come over to help him with the girls because my sister was not there. The only thing is I could not come over to help him with the girls because my abuser had locked me in the house that particular night and I couldn't get out. And we lived in a town home and we had bars on the house. And so the bars, we had bars on the windows and we um, had bars on the front and the back door and the bars locked from the outside in. So I couldn't get out. Even if it was a fire. I could not escape. I would be left for dead. And um, he had a habit of taking my car and he would leave his car home. His car was a stick and I could not drive a stick. Um, so I told my brother-in-law that I would love to come over and help you with the girls, um, but I cannot right now at this time. Um, I, of course, I did not tell him why I could not come over to help him with the children. I proceeded to call my parents to, you know, to tell my parents that my brother-in-law had called me and um, he asked me to come over and help him with the girls because he didn't know quite what to do with them. And he wanted to spend his time trying to find my sister. And I could just hear my mother in the background crying and pleading with me not to go. But what she didn't know is that I couldn't go anywhere. Um, and she just said to me, she says, something's wrong. I don't feel right. And I said, okay. Um, I proceeded to call my abuser. And um, of course, to no avail, I did not um, receive an answer and no return phone call. Um, my dad suggested to advise my brother-in-law to call the police and file a missing persons um, report, which he did. He followed each of my dad's instructions. And um, when daylight came, some of my family went over to um, their house to try to, you know, help find my sister um, to no avail, could not find my sister. My brother-in-law act as if everything was normal. Um, he had the girls and um, except for when my mom, I believe, went over with one of the family members. It, my oldest niece, the eight year old at the time, was acting very strangely. And my mom could pick up on some signs that something was not right. The D.C. police came out to try to look for my sister and to no avail. They said they could not find anything. Um, my dad at the time was a retired um, U.S. Deputy Federal Marshal, so my sister's missing case was turned over to the FBI. The FBI came in and they found her in the building, laying in a pool of her own blood. Why the D.C. police never went down to the basement or the storage bin is beyond us, but um, we're just grateful to God that the FBI was called in and they were able to find Linda's body immediately within no time at all. My brother-in-law that next day went to um, try to cash in on a large sum um, life insurance policy, which he could not cash in on. Um, and um, he then agreed to take a stress test, which he did not pass. He, we hadn't even gotten to a polygraph test at that point, and there was no need for one because he couldn't even pass the stress test. And um, he was taken into custody. At that time, he still wasn't charged with murder, um, you know, because the FBI and, and, and officials were just trying to let some things, you know, play out. And we buried my sister um, a week later. My parents went on to um, take care of my nieces and um, during that time, um, he was he was um, found guilty and convicted of murder. And my brother-in-law doing a court proceeding, um, he 
was sentenced to 15 years to life with the possibility of parole. With the possibility of parole. And I always like to specify that and, and repeat that because sometimes people think that when someone is convicted and they are sentenced and they get um, a number of years to life, it means that the person is, they're not eligible for parole. And I just want to clear that up and make sure that everyone understands that if an individual has with the possibility of parole, that means that they will more than likely be paroled at some point. We've spent the last 31 years fighting for my sister's legacy, as well as fighting for justice for my sister. So that became what we had to do for the past 31 years. When 15 year mark came and my brother-in-law had served 15 years, we started going to parole hearings. Um, and we started off, we went and So a family has to go through the parole hearing process it, um, between one to three years. Um, so we started off um, after his 15 year mark and he was up for parole. And um, he had a grid score of zero. He did everything right in prison. He was the fellow prisoner. He didn't get into any trouble. He worked. He did everything right. Um, he was a model prisoner. He was denied parole the first time. And um, we went back again, I believe, two years later. He was denied parole again. And he was actually denied parole eight times in a row. Our last parole hearing was July of this year, 2024. And he was denied parole again, 31 years. However, within a two week time frame of him being denied parole for the eighth time, he applied for a compassionate release. And um, because of his age and his time served in prison and a grid score of zero for 31 years, the judge who initially was going to deny his compassionate release because of um, the law students who represented him argued the case so eloquently, he was granted a compassionate release. So, you know, this evening, I just wanted to share the other ugly side when it comes to domestic violence. Domestic violence is ugly. Domestic violence is evil. Domestic violence destroys families. I can only share those facts with you because my family and I have gone through it and we're still going through it. Domestic violence tears families apart. It rips them apart. And if you Sadly enough, have been through what my family and I have been through, like so many other families that I know and that we all know. You never, you never get through it. You, you just don't get through it. You, you learn how to cope. You just learn how to cope. And you try to wrap your head around what could have been done differently. How would it have looked if he did not murder, you know, my sister? How would it look for the children? My nieces were split apart because, as I shared, my sister had a child prior to marrying him. So they did not have the same fathers. And so what the judicial system tells us is that if there is still a living parent, no matter if that parent is incarcerated, they have full legal rights 
to that child. So my brother-in-law had full legal rights to his daughter. And he did not want my family to raise his daughter. So he allowed his family to raise his daughter. So now you have two children at the ages of eight and three that not only witnessed the murder of their mother, and then they lose a father, and then they are split apart. To this day, we still do not have a relationship with my other niece. And my eight-year-old niece at the time will be 40 next month. So when I tell you again that domestic violence destroys families, it does. And we have to get to the root cause of what causes abusers to do what they do. And for him, it is a known fact that um, he grew up in an abusive household. His mother was an alcoholic. At a very young age, he was told that the man who was his father was not his father. He was then um, raised by his grandmother. The father that he told was his father that wasn't abandoned them. So he had been lied to. He had been abused. His mother was an alcoholic. And then he suffered from abandonment issues. So you have all of those things intertwined together. And it causes what? It causes mental issues, psychological issues. And at some point, you're going to take those anger issues as well out on someone. And that someone just happened to be my only sister. Not only did I lose my only sister, but I lost my brother as well. My brother took his own life a year and a half later after my sister was murdered. And one of the contributing factors to him taking his own life was that he could not deal with the death of my sister. We were very, very close. And he felt like it was his fault. He felt like he couldn't, he didn't or couldn't do anything to protect her. I too felt the same way. I too tried to commit suicide to take my own life. With a whole bottle of prescription pills and alcohol. I've never been an alcoholic, but that particular day I went to the liquor store and I bought a bottle of liquor. Don't even remember what it was because I know nothing about alcohol. And I decided that I couldn't do it anymore. I did not want to live anymore. I didn't want to live in anger. I didn't want to live in agony. I didn't want to live depressed. I didn't want to live and feel hopeless. But you know what? God woke me up with a terrible headache, feeling pitiful. And he told me that this wasn't the end, that I had work to do. Because I had promised God, as well as my nieces, during the night prior to my sister's funeral, that I would live my life to make certain that no one had to go through the pain that I was feeling during that time by themselves. I didn't know the promise that I was making. I didn't know how it was going to look. I didn't know where to start. I didn't know what I was going to do. But I do know that I had more stuff that I had to go through. And when I say stuff, I mean more abuse. My sister's heinous murder didn't even make me stop being in, an abuse, in abusive relationships. It carried over. I did not stop. Learn behavior. 
our unconscious addiction to domestic violence. We are teaching our children in the households that domestic violence is okay. I have heard elders say, if he doesn't beat you, he doesn't love you. I see oftentimes people in our churches send us right back home to our abusers to be beat on, to be killed, or to possibly commit murder ourselves. Because we as Christians operate out of the standard and principle of forgiveness. And until we ourselves become educated so that we can pass the education on, Domestic violence cannot and will not be eradicated. And I see that my, my sister April asked me a question. Did I ever receive counseling? I did receive counseling, April, by our beautiful sister, Queen of Fee. It took drastic measures, though, April. <laughs> drastic measures. And so we are teaching our children unconsciously that domestic violence is okay. And oftentimes, again, in, in our church homes, our pastors are not educated when it comes to domestic violence. And guess what? Some of our pastors are beating their wives at home and coming into the church on Sunday preaching a sermon. They won't even allow us to come into the churches to, to teach and share our testimonies when it comes to domestic violence. They're sending us right back home to our abusers and abusers right back home to their, you know, to their victims and their children to continue. April, my drastic measures were this. Monsters are easily created, yet hard to tame. After my sister's murder, I made a vow to myself that no one would ever hurt anyone that I loved ever again. And I made that vow to myself consciously. At, 31, at 34 years old, I became a mom myself. I wasn't prepared for what that looked like and what was to come. Um, my daughter was very sheltered. Um, she was just my little doll baby. And never did I think about her growing up and having to go through some of the things that I had gone through. And when my daughter got to um, school age, I was so overprotective of her. If you even looked at my daughter wrong, we had a problem. I was up at the school. The teachers knew who I was and they would always say, oh my gosh, here comes, I won't say my daughter's name, but here comes her mother. By the time my daughter was in fifth grade, she was being bullied by a young boy. It started off as verbal. Then he started touching on her, teasing her. Um, we had several meetings with his mom with the principals. Um, at some point, the teachers and the principal had told my daughter that, oh, he just likes you. You know, it's just cute behavior. He likes you. Well, that's a lie. One day on my way to pick my daughter up from school, she did not come out of the schoolhouse. Later on for me to discover that her bully on that day, he decided that he was going to body slam her jump on her and break her arm because she would not share a bag of chips with him. When I got to the school and I was informed of what happened, my monster came out on that particular day. I asked the teachers why they didn't call me. They couldn't give me a direct answer. 
I asked them where the little boy was. They could not give me a direct answer. We sent him home for the day. You sent him home? Okay, I'll go to his home. As I was proceeding to put my daughter in the car, whose arm was wrapped up because it had been broken. Oh, um, I asked him why he up, did that to my daughter. I don't know my favorite girl she's talking He did not give me the, the he did not give me the correct answer I was looking for that day. His words to me was, I don't give up. And I'll let you with the spider right there. After he gave me his answer. The only thing I would remember was everything going black and I started seeing stars. Every time we come here, right? When I came home, I was dangling an 11 year old child in my arms with one hand and he was coming out of his clothes. What's the name, bro? I so called the police the myself yeah. and told the police that someone was going to die that's on that particular that's day. That's 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 I knew what he was going to see. The police took me into the school building. I was in rage. They could not calm me down. They had to put me in a room because I had decided that I was not not every single one in the school building. Um, I think someone needs to mute their phone, please. Thank you so much. After that, I was taken into custody by my daughter, with my daughter witnessing it and all of her friends, teachers that have known me for years. When I arrived to the 5th District Police Precinct, the only thing I would remember was the intake officer telling me that I could not laugh because I was laughing profusely. I had lost my mind. And then he looked at me and I remember him distinctly saying, she's gone, y'all. She is gone. And he just kept saying, you can't laugh. You know, I'm taking your, pro I'm processing your picture. You can't laugh. That's all I remember. At some point I was released. But during that time, I sat in that jail cell on a Friday, the Friday, um, February. It was the February, 2014. The week weekend before um, Valentine's Day, my mom was sick. She was going through chemo. She was going through her second bout of cancer. My daughter's father had to take her to Children's Hospital to have to get checked out, and um, because her, like I said, her her arm was broken. I remember leaving that precinct on that night with no shoes. And then when they gave me my shoes, um, I was just gone. I don't remember what happened. I couldn't recall what happened. By the time I got to my parents' house, my um, my dad asked me a few questions because he thinks, <laughs> you know, he thinks from a legal point of view and I could not tell him anything. The only thing I do remember transpiring when I was in that jail cell was I heard a steel voice say to me, it is time. In April, that's when my healing journey began. That's when I knew that it was time for me to get the help that I so desperately needed. I went on that year and I was introduced to someone dear to me now and who is a sister and we have become family our families have become family and um she lost her only daughter to domestic violence as she's out here in our communities on a daily basis helping others educating others helping abusers helping victims and on her own walk in road to healing and her name is Queen of Fee. I had never met Queen in person, and I had met her virtually through a friend of mine who was going through domestic violence. And um, he would call me to share his story with him. I would never share my story. And one day I was inclined to tell my story. And he put me in touch with Queen of Fee. I had never met this lady in person, but she reached out to me and said, you're sharing your story on this day and at this time. And in December, on December 14, 2024, is when I shared my story. 
I explained to my family that I had to share it. I had to get it out because I needed healing. And that's when my healing journey began. And I haven't stopped since. I have not stopped since. I have been on the pavement with my sister, Queen of Fee, with April, with Maggie, Dr. Carolyn White Washington, beautiful believer, Renee Michelle, um, Angelina Harvey, so, so, so many others who have loved on me and who have embraced me. Our families have become families. And through this, um, I have gained so much healing and I have completely taken my power back. Not only from those who abused me, but from my sister's murderer. My family and I spent the last 31 years trying to figure out how life would look for us if my brother-in-law ever, you know, got paroled. In all honesty, I must share with each of you tonight that um, it's been life-changing, um, to say the least. While there is pain, we also feel a sense of release because we no longer have to look forward to parole hearings every one to two to three years. We don't have to think anymore about what we're going to say, what we're going to do, how we're going to feel. What are we going to do if he does get parole? Because it has happened now. He has his freedom as well. And we wish no ill feelings towards him. We'll still, you know, march on this journey to making sure that Linda's legacy stays alive. And we will continue to you know, fight for justice for her and for others, for victims, for those whose voices have been silenced due to the strongholds of domestic violence. We will continue to educate so that we can one day eradicate domestic violence. But we can't do it if we don't stick together. So tonight, if you don't remember anything else, I just, I just pray that one day that we all as victims and we all as advocates on this line can come together in unison to work together so that we can eradicate domestic violence. And I would like to end just by um, sharing a picture of my sister, Linda. And um, I may have to take my filter off. I think I probably do for you to get a better um, view of Linda. Um, this is my only sister, Linda, and she was five years older than me. Um, she was 29 years old. And um, as you can see, she was absolutely beautiful. She was one of the most smartest people that I knew. Um, when she walked in the room, she left a lasting impression on anyone who came into contact with her. She was absolutely brilliant. She was a, a daughter, a mother, a sister, a niece, a granddaughter, a cousin. And when I tell you that the sting is still fresh, 
for my entire family. It is, it's just that it's been 31 years and it still feels as though it was yesterday. Um, I wanted to take a chance to just acknowledge one of um, the questions that was put in the chat by my sister, Maggie Lewis. And she says, hi, you mentioned your niece was raped by this murderer. Were charges ever filed? If not, if not, would filing charges now keep him locked up? Well, Maggie, as sadly, he is not locked up. He is he is a free man now, as of um, I believe September of this year. Um, he was released from prison of September of this year. And um, yes, charges were filed. My niece was eight years old at the time that she was raped. And about um, four years ago, she decided to come forth and tell her truth. And so we are going through that journey now, Maggie. Um, we never pushed her. We wanted her to do it in her own time, although we knew that he had raped her after he murdered my sister. Um, we never put any pressure on her. We wanted it to be something you know, like I said, that she did in her own time. And so we have supported her 100% on her journey um, from eight years old up until now. And we will continue to do just that, support her. Um, and again, I just want to share that if you or anyone that you know are going through the strongholds of domestic violence, please reach out to the domestic violence hotline at 1-800-799-7233. You can reach out to any of us advocates. My name is Lisa Council and my organization is SHIFT, Self-Healing Ignites Flourishing Transformation. And I am Linda's voice. My website is shiftinc.org and my email address is lisa at shiftinc.org. You can reach out to my dear sister, Carolyn White Washington, Sisters for Sisters. I see that my sister Maggie is here. You can reach out to my sister, April Chambers. You can reach out to my dear sister, Queen of Fee, who educates both abusers and survivors and victims, I'm a witness. I'm telling you right now, without it, it would not have changed my life. I would still be held in bondage. And there are so many other advocates that you can reach out to. More importantly, when you decide that you've had enough and you do want to escape your abuser, do it in secret, have a plan, do not think that you can leave on your own. You must reach out to a professional advocate, someone who can advocate on your behalf and someone who can get you out safely. My sister didn't do that. I didn't do that when I was going through. It's by the grace of God that I'm living. Had my sister done that or known that, there's a strong possibility that she would still be here. But you cannot do it alone. You cannot escape alone. You must have a strategic escape plan. And if you don't know how to go about that, reach out to one of us advocates. If one of us don't have the resources or whatever that you stand in need of, we'll put you in contact with someone who does and who can help you. And I just want to say to each of you on this evening, thank you so much for taking the time to tune in to the Sisters for Sisters Love Talk. You are not alone. Thank you so much for taking the time and thinking it not robbery to listen to my testimony. And thank you for your love that's been offered here on this evening and for your continued prayers for my family and I. And I love you so much and peace and blessings, everyone. Thank you. Good night.